All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You're listening to the Currency of Discourse podcast with myself, Jay, and my co-host, Quaid. Um, been a while since we got an episode out to you, um, but we're feeling pretty good. Um, like this one's finally going to make it to air. And um, we're going to be talking about a couple things today on this episode. Um, first of which, we're going to talk about Rogerian argumentation as well as the principle of charity and the principle of humanity. And just kind of explore different thoughts um, with those concepts, and we'll just see where it takes us um, and see where it goes. So I'm going to pass it over to my compadre, Mr. Quaid. Uh, yeah, so I guess I'll just start with Rogerian. Sure. Uh, yeah, you know a little bit about it too. Uh, a little bit, yeah. But basically, um, the idea is to it's that in an argument there's a process, and the process is that someone makes a claim first, and then whoever the opponent is, the person who opposes the claim, has to first explain what the other person's actual claim is or what their argument is in a way that the first person will agree. So it may sound something like, um, I think global warming is true because the ice caps are melting, because the overall average temperature of the uh, earth is increasing along with the CO2 emissions of humans and so somebody who opposed that claim would first have to reiterate or would have to say so what you're saying is global warming uh is or climate change however wish however you wish to define it uh is a real phenomenon because and then you give the original person's premises and once that's established then you move on and say okay well you know, here is where I think uh, one of your premises doesn't lead to your conclusion or um, what, I, you know, um, uh, why your conclusion isn't, uh, why your conclusion isn't, is missing something or maybe there's possible data that the person hasn't engaged with. But the point is all that would happen after it's established what is actually believed first. And it's a step in communication an argumentation that I think we're not used to. Is it too simple to just say it's it's basically regenerative argumentation is, you know, like strong active listening skills? It requires strong a- active listening skills. It requires it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, it definitely requires it. Uh, and it's also not the same. So if like you go to different websites, different websites will give you different definitions of how to actually do it or what it is. So, like, mine is just kind of, like, what I've pulled from the multiple definitions I've seen and kind of, like, brought together. But they're done very differently, actually. Mm -hmm. But I think that is a summation of what the overall idea behind uh, Rogerian argumentation is. Well, and another thing, too, is that um, the difference between Rogerian argumentation and Aristotelian argumentation is that you're coming from a place of cooperation, compromise, Whereas Aristotelian is a, is is more along the lines of this argument is wrong or this argument is right. Um, yeah, and I think that's a key distinction between the two styles of, of argumentation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, it do, it it breaks down a lot of the barriers between uh, opponent, you know, as as kind of we see it in a game because the first step is is always to understand the other side. You know, and in, in a game, you don't really have to understand the other side in so much as, or yeah, you don't have to understand the other side as much as you do just how to play your own side, so to speak. Like it's all about uh, uh, proposing. It's it's all about proposing your own idea, and so we see this a lot because I mean, when you watch news, or I mean, this is really you could in real time turn on your news channel and watch two people communicating and it's very clear that this component is missing this skill or this whatever you want to call it this method is missing because the way it usually works is 
I propose an idea, you completely disregard what my argument is, or I propose an argument is the way I should put it. You completely disregard what my argument is and then give your own argument as if there's some, so you end up like talking past the other person. Mm -hmm. We're not even established on what it is we're talking about and what the conclusion that each person is making, what evidence that relies on or what argument uh, is being made to prove the conclusion, what premises are being given to, to prove the conclusion. Yeah, and I think um, when it comes to, you know, like talking head media where people are having debates on, you know, whichever media outlet you want to you wanna name, it's not conducive to Rogerian argumentation or it's not tailored that way. Mm-hmm. Um, you you have a minimal amount of time to get your point across. It's not conducive to having a conversation um, because to, to have, a I think, a strong Rogerian type of conversation, that takes time because you have to define things. You have to figure out exactly where you are in the conversation. Not that, that's, not that you wouldn't do that in Aristotelian argumentation as well, um, but in, in talking head media, you know, you have you have a minimal amount of time and you have to get your point across and you don't have time to to. Um, there's no incentive to compromise. You want to get your point out there, your opinion out there and make sure that that sticks with the listener. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I mean that but that in itself poses other questions about society It's like, OK, well, this style of conversation is promoted in our media. So this is what the listener is often consuming. Yeah. And. Would it be better for the listener to hear what Roger, Rogerian argumentation looks like as opposed to Aristotelian type debate? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that brings up a lot of uh, different uh, points and avenues regarding the topic because one is the fact that uh, in, in terms of time, you're absolutely right. And then there's a reason that the time is so short on conversations and it has to do with a lot of time for money a lot of it revolves around capitalism a lot of it revolves around you have a book coming out you don't want to lose the debate because that will translate into potentially loss of funds of people buying your book so you don't set it up in a way in which you can you might actually end up on bottom in the conversation and so it promotes yeah a conversation in which i ignore what you say and I just go ahead sure. and give my own point. Uh, and so there's economic benefit behind mm-hmm. that. We've, we've set up a system in which it is beneficial to. We're not, we're not coming to the topic as if this is a problem we both have and need to solve. We're coming to the topic as if we've already solved it each on our own. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're just going to play our different chess games and act like we're sure. playing the same. And if the author gives any ground... You know, in a, in a talking head situation where they're online or on TV promoting their book, well, then it's like, okay, he gave ground in this interview. Why am I bu- why am I buying this book with the argument that he's making? Mm-hmm. He's just conceded something, you know. Yeah. So you're right. It's not it's not conducive um, to that. The systems. Of the- yeah. yeah. And that goes a lot into uh, how we perceive people. And how we perceive uh, arguments, the fact that uh, there's so much ethos around uh, how we process information, uh, the idea that we are we are more concerned about status, you know, as opposed to, again, problem solving. So uh, that person doesn't want to give ground because uh, people view giving ground as a negative thing. And that goes right in, you know, that's right in the, the vein of politics. It's like when a politician says, oops, you know, you, you can't say, you can't change your mind. And yeah, politics. that's definitely an American thing. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I'm not sure because I don't watch it that much. Uh, but you've watched more media from other countries than I have. So I know I just think the idea of not giving ground seems to be an American mm-hmm. value. Yeah. Um, you know, there's never, never retreat type type mentality yeah um stand your ground yeah what were you saying before that though i kind of jumped in on you i think that's pretty much it i think uh i covered it on that i mean uh 
Yeah, I think that Rajirian, I mean, now that we're kind of talking about it, I can see that it goes into a lot of different, you know, that's that that's really just one component that makes you think about all the other components you would need to have a successful conversation because that can't be the only one. You know? well, well, let's bring in the principle of charity or principle of humanity. How, how, how do you incorporate those things into Rogerian argumentation? Well, yeah, so let me, I have, and we could actually talk about some more concepts today too, which I think could be helpful. But well, I, I have principle of humanity up if you want to look up principle of charity. Well, sure, do you, wanna, so, do you want to go ahead and spot that Yeah, off? so principle of humanity um, states that when interpreting another speaker, we must assume that his or her beliefs and desires are connected to each other and to reality and in some way, and attribute to him or her the propositional attitudes one supposes one would have oneself in those circumstances. Um, yeah. So that takes a, a high amount of empathy. Sure. And that's, that's difficult um, for a lot of people, especially if you have a strong opinion about something. Um, it's hard to um, have a conversation with someone who has an opinion an opposing viewpoint that's just as strong and come from a place of empathy, especially if those ideas clash um, and can't mesh well together. Yeah. Yeah, I think the the there's a lot going on there. So, I mean, to take that apart and, and kind of fit it into the, the map uh, that's being painted here with Roger and argumentation about how a conversation might go, uh, you know, the first thing is you have to recognize that people... We've talked about this before. It's a good thing to talk about. You live a linear life. You live on a very straight line. You only occupy you, you only occupy one space at any given time, and that's it. And it's never, ever the same space at the same time as somebody else. So that means that right there, the stimuli that you are taking in is just not the same as other people that you're around and you need to take that into consideration when you're interpreting their argument. That's the whole point of supposing that they have the beliefs that you would have in their position. Right. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that there's not right or wrong, but it does mean that there's uh, that uh, one, you're not assuming that this person is just completely batshit crazy. Right. So that's one thing is that you're, you're assuming that they are perceiving reality as it actually is to some extent when it comes to this issue. Um, and it, again, it doesn't mean they're right, but you do have to uh, recognize that if you're going to communicate with them uh, and potentially even change a mind. You have to recognize that. Like, so for instance, uh, being a person who thought way differently than what they think now, um, I can look back on some of my old experiences with new knowledge. And when I see somebody uh, who who believed something that I used to believe, right? It's, it's not, and I hear this all the time, it's baffling to some people that people can believe that. And I guess that's where I feel lucky to have some of the experiences that I've had in life because... I can now look at that person with more compassion and be like, no, it's, it's just a simple mistake. Like, you know, it's just like, you don't know better essentially. Right. And then also recognizing that I might not know better now. And so I could just, I could, I could just be wrong. And to approach every conversation, I think, as, as I said before, as if you could come out on bottom as any conversation, any conversation you could come out as the person that's like, man, I didn't really think of that. Or that instead of, um, another way of putting that would be like instead of the one imparting wisdom to someone else, because that's generally what people want to do is they want to give their wisdom to others mm. um, and tell them, you know, this is how things are. Um, and and instead of thinking that way, you're going into a conversation with the, with the mentality that someone might impart wisdom to me. Mm -hmm. And that wisdom might result in me changing my my beliefs or my opinions. Now, that doesn't mean that you should, you know, b uh, give up a, a belief so quickly. Um, just because someone's giving you information that takes time to evaluate, um, think about, but it's, I think it's, it's useful to have the attitude that like I could come away learning something from someone else rather than being the one that's always imparting the wisdom. Um, and how do we, how do we incorporate principles of charity into this? 
Uh, so let me see. So I'm going to read it. Uh, the principle of charity or charitable interpretation requires interpreting a speaker's statements in the most rational way possible and in the case of any argument, considering its best, strongest possible interpretation. Uh, so I, I think that's good uh, or useful in regards to Rogerian argumentation, especially in, in the political landscape that we find ourselves in now, because uh, I, I often hear um, the terminology or phrase phrases between the right and the left, the Republican and the Democratic Party, um, the phrases like the enemy. Um, a lot of Democratic uh, Democrats, progressives, they refer to people, you know, the, the, the whole phrase deplorables or, or the enemy. Those are phrases that I hear used. And, and, and equally, you hear those kinds of phrases um, from the Republican Party towards, you know, they're, they're ruining this nation. They're changing the way things are. Um, when you incorporate the principle of charity, you're assuming that, that that person came to the conclusions that they came in, they came to, those beliefs that they have, are for some good reason. And mm-hmm. they have good reason for thinking those thoughts. And that's more useful in in kind of defeating the the tribalism that we kind of find ourselves in now uh, that seems to be a popular thing that's talked about in, in conversation a lot now is tribalism and coming from the place that like okay these individuals that have different ideas than me it comes from a place where they, they they've really thought about these things and it's reasonable that they think them from from the experiences that they've they've had yeah um and i think that that helps you bring um i guess a more uh, an opportunity for for compromise and um really coming to the table to find solutions with people that have different ideas than you if you take that approach mm-hmm. um again instead of something that's um antagonistic yeah yeah i think that uh the principles of charity or humanity might meld a little bit and i think they all work in conjunction you can it's, it's really important to think yeah, about absolutely. how they work because uh, then there's i think principle of humanity there's these connections being made right uh, i think another thing that you could do with principles of charity is um, a situation where the person isn't even sure what their argument is and I've been in those scenarios where I'm, I'm arguing with somebody who has a position that they can't give me the best argument. So I give them the best argument. I say, does this sound like a good argument? Even though they haven't told me what it is, I imagine what the best possible interpretation of the argument is. And I, and I try to get them there because you've done two things at that point. One is that you've helped a person. You've helped a person articulate their own ideas where they couldn't, mm-hmm. right? So again, and that takes the... I'm not just here to defeat you mentality, right? It really takes, it's, it's like going to the other side's army and being like, let me show you how your arm, let me show your army how to, you know, fight. It just wouldn't make sense. But that's because we're talking about killing each other. That's an army mentality, right? Yeah. Uh, us versus them. The other way, it's more like what a counselor would do or what somebody who had positive, what they call positive emotional regard for another person would do. Um, and then it also helps in that if you can still show the other person like, okay, you know, and I understand why you, you think this way, but consider this, you know, it helps us move from then that very strong position into understanding how that position works and where the problems really lie in it, you know? And at that point, you've done a few things, uh, you've done, you've done even more, you've built your ethos. So you've now talked to that person when you help somebody out people generally acknowledge that to some degree, right? Yeah, of course. And then so at that point, you become a person who isn't trying to kill them so much as just try to get to the bottom of something. You become, again, uh, we've said this in the past, but it it might be reiterated probably multiple times. It's kind of like the difference between standing across from somebody on a road where the other person is looking at you and you're looking at them like you're about to gunsling each other, right? Like you're about to have a showdown as opposed to walking next to that person, right? And it's just like he thinks he knows the path path forward and you think you know the path forward. But if you know his path, he's explained his path and you know what's wrong with the path, you can take a look at it and be like, okay, are you saying this is how we get here? 
they're going to say, yeah, okay, well, this is where I'm saying we can get to the same spot, but with less steps, you get what I'm saying? Like it, it, it does so much more in terms of progress in any conversation. It takes so much effort. Yeah. And then I like when you were saying that too. Yeah. It takes, it takes a lot of effort to, to have those conversations. Um, it is, it's easier to, um, just come from a place of like, this is my idea. Um, and I don't really need to hear what you have to say. Mm -hmm. Um, but when you come from a place, um, of compromise like that, there's, uh, I guess there's, a, uh, I don't know, more hope. I don't know how, how else I want to put that right now. I think it's more productive just generally. There's no way it isn't more productive. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you really think about it, cause it's just like, you're not resisting your flow. You're, you're going with something instead of get against something. And it's just like, obviously one's going to be easier. Sometimes it's hard to, you can imagine how it's like hard to flow with some people. Like you're just not going to be able to, because you're not going to be able to push them in a productive uh, direction. Sure. But what about when someone has a controversial idea that, that I mean, is just com uh, gives you a completely visceral reaction. That's you what I'm to, saying. You want to help them with their argument? No, no. That's what I'm saying is that yeah. it's, some people are going such a negative direction that it yeah. would just take, it, it, it might even do you damage to, yeah, so, to, to go to those locations. Yeah. At what point do you stop? What, uh, what, at what point do you say, I, ca I can't go down this road of like granting you all these things that yeah. you and in and, and, and like bolstering your argument yeah um yeah yeah no you're definitely right and you definitely don't want to leave it at that if you do sure because that can also be dangerous if you just have the first part of the conversation where you strengthen their argument they're just going to re you're they're going to use that information to reinforce their own idea mm. and uh you just created a monster so it really t like you were saying earlier it's a process like it takes time uh, more time than we see on Fox News or CNN or any of those yeah, channels. Yeah, exactly. It's important to note that in conversation, you know, we don't, we, we're not saying one interaction. Mm. You know, so to get to the bottom of something, you know, if, if you're having a discussion with an individual and you're really trying to get to the, to the underlying issue, you know, the core of the, the thing that you're talking about, that conversation doesn't necessarily just take place in one interaction. And this could take um, place over a long period of time, yeah. um, over a sequence of actually different conversations. Um, but uh, there's and then it works better that way too. Yeah, it does because you develop that relationship. So you can't expect to go into a conversation with someone on the very first day um, if they have a very core belief, even if you have better information. You know, they're not going to change that in one day. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's not going to happen for the, you know, the reverse. It's not going to happen for you. It exposes you to new information. That might take time for you to digest that and sit with it and, you know, figure out how to frame that new information along with all the other things that you believe. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the other thing is important to note is that, you know, if you're trying to apply these principles, whether it's charity or humanity, it's 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 really it's not really possible to do if the other person is not invested in um, applying those principles for you. Yeah, because you will lose those arguments if if you're thinking win lose. Mm -hmm. You're never going to get to a place where they're reciprocating um, that respect. Because I think principles of, of humanity and charity are all about respect. And yeah, they are. Um, but you can also teach someone to I think reflect. I think you can, I think there does come a point where you concede so much that the other person is just like, maybe that's something you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm not saying for sure. And I could see like, if someone's really resistant, you're not going to, you know, I mean, that's the whole point is that you have to have, like you were saying, you have to have some level of respect. Uh, but I do, I have had conversations where the other person doesn't do x y and z but then i do it and then they reflect they start to do it themselves and i think it's because ultimately you start to see it as a better way like they're just like oh wow he actually understands me and then the point comes in their conversation where you keep saying no that's not what i'm saying that makes you look bad because you're just like wait you always understand what i'm saying but i never understand what you're saying you know but that again takes time to get to that place it's not just something that someone's probably going to notice on the first run you know 
Yeah, and that's a that's kind of a leadership trait too. You know, just being a good individual is you're 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 setting the example. Mm-hmm. So if they're not reciprocating that initially, if you maintain that course, you know, you're more likely that they would adopt that rather than just reverting back to like, well, this person is is more interested in conflict, so that's how I have to play it too. Yeah, it's like yeah, you could do that, but if you if you if you stay the course and and continue to ap- apply these principles over a series of conversations de- while developing that relationship if it's a, if it's a stranger that you're talking to or someone that you're um only a, a, an acquaintance of yeah it's it is more likely that down the road they will adopt those things yeah yeah for sure and uh i think uh now that we're talking about all this in terms of the time cuz I, I really think that is the most important thing that you could probably get from a lot of this is that it is going to take time, but that really what we've probably failed to do is to build communities around strong communication or they're, they're probably just not in abundance, you know? So like finding, uh, community communities of people who know how to communicate and how to display that to other people. Uh, so that way that you, you can, you can build, I guess it's it's uh it's hard to build a community with people that you don't agree with, right? Mm-hmm. Like that would just be hard to do. Um so I guess we've we've failed to build a more global community, I guess, is the idea. It's it's the idea that uh we can apparently communicate with each other internally, like when we agree enough with each other, but we haven't built communities around the concept or we just haven't built communities. We ha- yeah, we haven't built communities around the concept that it's okay if we don't agree, but at the same time, that doesn't mean we don't have to change our minds, you know? So like uh, communities of people where everybody is open to changing their mind uh, and everybody is invested in learning new things, like we've just failed to instill those in enough people that uh, it means something, mm-hmm. uh, or maybe we're just getting there. Maybe this we're just watching this in action. Like we're watching the development of uh, a new community of people uh, who know how to do these things, and it's just like, well, the concepts are fairly new you know, modern science and the world getting smaller and technology, you know, it really is all in the budding stages. So, yeah. At some point, though, when it comes to developing communities around um, strong communication and openness, you know, inevitably you have to make decisions um, as to which direction to go. You know, are we going to go left? Are we going to go right? Mm. Um and there's there's just generally going to have to be someone that concedes or someone that um, is left out. Um, their idea is not incorporated um, or their idea just doesn't work in conjunction with however else that community is shaped. Um, it's just it's, a, it's I think it's a hard balancing act to try and figure out. Um, how open are you before you start making decisions and closing things off? I don't know. Yeah. uh, I think this is also a good time to uh, talk about something else, which is there's something new happening in a lot of communities, which is, which revolves around argumentation, which is the idea that um, the best that you can do is try to build values with that other person first or beliefs, belief sets. To find where the overlap, oh, where the overlapping components are, and start from there, and that probably has a lot to do with building communities. That is essentially probably what a community is: is when you build alliances with people who have similar values or beliefs, and we've failed to do that fundamentally. Is this a neighborhood? Is this a city? State? Uh, it, it, it it can actually be. Levels? It's actually not as simple as that probably because you can have like a community that is a neighborhood but then you can have a community of online gamers and that is also a community 
uh, with different values. And so mm -hmm. it's more like overlapping circles with individuals mm -hmm. in them. You occupy more than one circle. I mean, I think people do gravitate. They do go to places generally where their values are in line with the other people. I mm -hmm. think that that already does happen. Yeah, but we haven't done it fundamentally. That's the thing. Is it, That's the reason that... Uh, scientists can't connect with a good 60 percent 50 to 60 percent of the population is because they don't have overlapping values or or actually what i i think personally is that they do have overlapping values they just haven't had a conversation about it yet mm -hmm. so concepts like that that really the language that they're using makes it difficult to identify the things that they also. do have in common mm -hmm. um yeah there's a lot of uh miscommunication not being understood things like that but i think that the value i think that there are i think there are a lot of overlapping values like uh so for instance what it might look like and what i've done with people is i ask them how do we build knowledge and like i'd say a lot a vast majority of the time the way that conversation usually goes just to just to begin the process is well if i experience it if i see it touch it taste it and it's just like well that's that's empiricism that's what scientists are trying to do right so it's just like right there you you now have an overlapping principle that if we see it touch it taste it feel it we can be assured to some degree that the phenomenon is real or that we're actually seeing it incorporated into reality and it's just like well is that anything you know anything you see touch taste and they're like well no well, some people hallucinate and so you you begin to have the same conversation about how to build reality but we just haven't done it. We just simply uh, haven't done it. And I think that goes back into to Rogerian argumentation because, again, it's the idea that maybe it's not just so much even understanding the argument, but the person fundamentally, like what are their values and beliefs from the start? Because they're probably all attached. All the arguments and premises are attached to a network. And you really have to understand the network before you can get to the specifics of an argument. How often do you think people actually sit down and, and think, what are my values, um, what matters to me, and how did I come up with those things? Because I don't think that that's something that the average individual does. I generally would, I, I mean, I'm making an assumption here, but I would say that most people kind of, they like inherently know mm -hmm. what their values are. Yeah. And they don't spend much time asking themselves, well, what is it what is it actually and where does it come from I, I don't know that i see that a lot yeah i don't see that either but is it is it is that necessary yeah do you think yeah it is i think i think I, yeah yeah for sure and so spurring that on like even starting it can do a whole whole it can create a process in them where if you ask them fundamentally like what are your values and beliefs and where do they come from how do you build your reality or just maybe that even that just question like how do you build your reality how do you build it tell me how you start and then they begin to question it because they never did. You know, it's just like, well, I just, I know. Like, I just know what reality is. We all have mm -hmm. this presupposition until you can break that where you recognize, like, I don't really know what reality is. I don't decide the rules, you know? Like, I just kind of make them up as I go along. And then once you get to that place, I kind of get to Descartes. Uh, I don't know what it's called, but basically where he jettisons every belief, you know, fundamentally. And you start from scratch, uh, and because we can't really, we can't really build it if we already feel like it's it's already built or we already know. I, I think the the. I I think if you, the later it takes you to do something like that, the more difficult and the more dangerous it is because hmm. you've already built these other parameters around different belief systems that you have. And, and then if you come to a question like that later in life, after you've built all these other, other ideas, um, in, in 30 seconds, you can figure out like, oh, that doesn't match mm. things that I think. Wait a second. You know, and, and then you, you're in like uh, dark water at that point. Yeah. Like existential dread. Yeah. 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 No, you're right. Yeah, for sure. And that's why. I think one question that we could explore on the show and might be really important is when do you not challenge even though you know it's incorrect? Like when are the times where the person that you may want to persuade 
or to change their mind, even though you would go into it again, not assuming that you were just all out correct. But when is it where I know why the person's wrong, but I, I, uh, I would decrease their well-being and potentially a lot of other people's if I shattered that. And does that exist? Does that exist? Is there a barrier? And that goes back to the, the truth versus well-being uh, dilemma that I've seen before, but I haven't heard actually talked about a lot, uh, which is which one do you value more and why? Yeah, truth wor- versus well-being is, is a difficult one. I, I would definitely say that um, I wouldn't lie. I don't think I would lie to um, prevent from hurting, you know, like to stop myself from hurting someone's well-being. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean that you have to um, reveal all to them. You know, yeah. To open Pandora's box. Um, yeah, Kenneth Burke actually talks about that. He talks about how we can pretend like everything's hardline truth, but the reality is that there's a truth we encase in stylization, the way that we present the information, mm-hmm. and they do they do make a difference. Yeah, for sure. Um, there's a, there's an art um, as well as science to speaking to people, and the way that you say things can affect. I mean, that's obvious. The way that you say things can affect their well their well being. Um, but in terms of truth versus well being. Um, I I could spend a lot of time on that question. I'd have to like sit and think about it yeah, before so I, I just answered it on microphone because I I would change my mind. Oh yeah, as soon as I I've I've done it before, myself. and in my head just kind of goes into circles. Yeah, because there's always scenarios where it seems like one or the other. There's you know, it becomes very difficult very quickly, especially if you're trying to maintain ideas. So uh, I mean, do you develop different parameters for different circumstances? Or are you the kind of person that's like, well, this is just you follow these guidelines every time? No, it's it's there's too many contradictions for me, at least from yeah. what I could tell trying yeah. to do it. Yeah, there's just way too many contradictions with anything. Because, I mean, in truth versus well-being, truth might win out in one scenario, whereas mm-hmm. well-being might be the right approach in another scenario. But I, 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 I'm pretty confident, though, that the, that the one concrete thing I could say is I wouldn't lie to to. Um, you know, Trump well-being over truth. Yeah, and I'm probably on the other end of the coin because I would lie. I would actually do a lot, but that's the problem is I've thought about it and my inclination is to go with well-being, but I value truth so much that that makes it very uh, repulsive, the idea of doing something like that. Mm. Because I do, I value well-being over a lot and I would make a lot of sacrifices for it just because I think it is what we mean when we say good most of the time like a vast majority of the time. But at the same time, I mean, I mean, you know me. So it's just like, I, I really, I, I think that we have a problem with separating reality from fiction to a point that harms us. And so it's just like you immediately end up participating. And I, 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 I'm not under the delusion that, first of all, if we talk about day-to-day dilemmas. I don't know how, how often it actually even matters. I don't know how often well-being actually is pinned against truth. And that might be a conversation to have. But I think that uh, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. So, well, I think in day to day life, in truth versus well being, you see it in you know relationships or friendships or mm, you know okay. uh, someone you know like a, a partner, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever. Um, you know because maybe maybe they ask you a question that you're like, well, if I answer this, they're not going to like. Right. It. Right. Yeah. Um, so in that's in those moments, that's when you're evaluating is their well-being there you matter go. more versus the truth that's where you see that the most in day-to-day yeah yeah and that's where it comes into conflict because it's like in order to maintain the well-being i have to participate in a system that i'm fostering and there's no del- there's no delusion about that if you lie to your friend you are creating a system in which people have to lie in circumstances if you mm. took that away you would condition the response to be truthful we condition these responses in, in humans to the point where we have to foster that system in order for there not to be any uh, um, uh, flaws or, or dysfunction, essentially. And you wouldn't say that truth automatically equals well-being, right? No. But it, the, it should sound like it should 
I want to say that truth equals well-being. Yeah. That's what I want to say. I think it might in a system. I'm not convinced that's the case, though. Yeah. I think it might in a system that we create that's like that. Possibly. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I've, I've, I, I really don't know, but, yeah, it, but you can never account for everything being truthful. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know how you would do that. I'm not sure. Yeah. But, uh, you know, that's just, uh, that's, that's, uh, a, a really tough question. And, uh, I think that, uh, in terms of, I don't know. I just, I think that, uh, we have to, again, it goes back to strategy. It goes back to strategy. And I think that, uh, there it was quintillion. I can't remember exactly who said it, but they basically said that a rhetorician, what a rhetorician was, the idea of somebody who's really good at persuading people mm-hmm. is, uh, well, I'll amend it to be more, uh, 21st century, but, uh, it's a great person speaking well. And so the idea of a great person, you know, like the person has to emulate certain qualities themselves. And one of those qualities is just invariably honesty, you know, so it's a great person speaking well. So it's, it's, it's actually, it's actually, it might be, uh, the idea that if you get good enough at it, you don't have to lie as much. You can get good at telling the truth. Cause if you think about it, a person who isn't as good with the word, their words is more likely to just have to say something direct Mm-hmm. Rather than being able to still get the truth across, but yeah. masquerade it in a way that doesn't uh, offend the other person, so they take it way better. Yeah. So we could start by saying, like, if you if you can tell the truth while maintaining someone's well being, that's always better. Yeah. It's always better to be truthful on that occasion. But if you don't have that skill, that's when you have to start playing between which one do I value more? Mm-hmm. Because I can't. I might not be able to get away with telling the truth and maintaining someone's well-being if it could be destructive to them or hurt them whereas you know you might be able to in the same situation that i find myself in you might be able to utilize the truth where i couldn't Mm -hmm. Um, and i'm not saying again i'm not saying that in that situation i would lie to maintain their well-being but um reserve my full opinion or feeling Mm -hmm. yeah yeah, and I think that's a that's a that's a pretty big picture about what we're talking about in terms of Rogerian argumentation and principles of charity and humanity. Uh, the idea that it is a lot about connection. It's about so so when you when you said what you just said, it made me think about uh, the fact that we're from different communities ourselves. You know, we mm-hmm. talked about different communities, and there are probably communities that you could you would be a better speaker to that. Yeah, that perfect. Set. Perfect than I would. And so when I was in that scenario, I would end up fumbling, uh, or maybe possibly being put into a scenario where I would lie. Uh, whereas you wouldn't and vice sure. versa. Sure. Yeah, exactly. So I, I feel comfortable communicating with, uh, more easily with people who are from like rural areas. Mm-hmm. Cause I come from like a, a family of farmers and, and, and people who live out in the country. And so for me, it's easy to, communicate with people from those areas in the country yeah whereas you might be better at communicating with people from like urban areas yeah than than i am yeah from the city from urban areas yeah absolutely and that's a lot because of the the way we're raised and i was even thinking like so another component to being able to speak well a great man is actually the quote a great person speaking well um has to understand different communities in a general sense. Mm -hmm. And that's politicians are probably really good at that. That's probably what they're doing is that they, they're not just speaking to one community. They're speaking to multiple and they know how to speak in such a way that can just overlap with all of those communities. It's like broad cultural knowledge. Exactly. And they end up, and then they kind of push on those little Mm -hmm. cultural nodes. And if you push too far to the left, you're going to miss this community over here. If you push too far over here, you're going to miss the other community. So you really have to play a very delicate balancing. Yeah. And there's cases, you know, I'm trying to think of one as I'm saying this now, and I don't know if I'll be able to, but we can see clips of politicians trying to do that. And it hasn't, they've flopped, right? Because they actually can't relate to the person (laughs) that they're talking to. Um, 
and then and then you know that's viewed a billion times on the internet because they look silly. Mm-hmm. So maybe they use a word that they would never really use to try to appeal to someone, or maybe they change their accent. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's videos of uh, Hillary Clinton, you know, talking more Southern mm. when she's in the South. Yeah, and talking in a more like transatlantic type accent when she's in the North. And it comes off as in a, inauthentic. Right. Um, and then th- that's where you you start to lose your ability to, I mean, if we're talking about truth and well-being, if you can't do things without authenticity, you, you're, 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 you're hurting your ability to speak the truth and to provide well-being to someone else because you're, you're being disingenu- disingenuous. Yeah, yeah. And the thing is, though, if, if as a politician you create that system, then you have to do those things because you've created the system. And any time you engage in it, you perpetuate the system. So, I mean, what we would need is like an absolute overhaul, a revolution of the way that we speak around politics, the way that we uh, elect politicians and so on and so forth. Uh, what you were saying made me think of, uh, I watched, I think I told you this before, but it was two chains and and john Kasich, yeah, yeah. and essentially the same thing happened it's just like john Kasich said something you could see what what be roll what be goldberg's eyes just do a backflip like she her eyes were rolling in her skull so hard uh and you know why when you watch the clip it's just like he's trying to connect to a community that he's not that familiar with and then it, it, it ends up hurting his rapport right yeah so, so and some now, with that population yeah if he has something valid to say it's no longer going to be heard yeah uh, because people have now identified at least in that circumstance he's not being authentic yeah so what he has to say is of no use to me because i can't trust it i can't rely on it yeah and I think uh, ultimately what we need for bigger impact or change are, are communicate like great communicators, like great communicators, ones that ha- are, are in the middle of multiple circles speaking to very diverse groups. And that's something like who, who maybe we should make a list or something of people that we think do that um, because they're certainly out there for sure. You know, like I think about somebody that just to start off, somebody like Dwayne johnson Mm -hmm. uh he seems to be able to occupy this space of everybody likes him yeah yeah and everybody can identify with him and it's just like well how does he act he actually doesn't act like any one person you know he's very he's very laid back so that's one thing like he's i think he's he's tapped into very basic uh similarities between us like he's he's very confident and laid back and that's something we all want and want to be and we like to see other people do right so he's he's really picked up on certain qualities that transcend all those different communities uh and that's ideally where you would want your uh main personality to be if you were interested in communicating with large swaths of the population yeah well he's thinking about running for president so yeah i know (laughs) yeah so is kanye west interesting yep um so we've done about 30 minutes. Um, is there anything else that you feel like a, a road we should go down or we should explore a little bit more? I mean, actually, no, I think that's a, I think this is a good first start. I think this is actually a pretty solid basis for other conversations we'll have on specific topics. Now yeah. that we've laid a lot of uh, terms out there, uh, we could talk about some other ones. Um, or maybe we'll save them for... Uh, other conversations will come out over time uh but I, yeah i think for now that that's that's okay well in the spirit of you know regenerative re- argumentation what we were talking about earlier is that um a conversation doesn't necessarily just p- take place in one interaction so this this particular interaction may be the beginning of a more developed conversation on these topics um, as we go out, go throughout this uh, process of uh, bringing content to, to the, you know, the Internet um, and all that. Um, but we want to thank everyone for taking the time to listen to us. Is there anything that you wanted to add last minute? No, I'm good. Yeah, we appreciate everybody listening. Um, we hope thank that, you. Yeah, we hope that you uh, 
um, were able to, you know, this was able to um, inspire you um, to think about things in a different way. Um, we would like to hear from you. So if you see this posted online right now, we're only on YouTube at this point, but we're trying to, we'll, we'll get to a point where we'll expand. But if you listen to this, you found it useful or you want to give us, um, you know, feedback, um, you know, if that's critical, we're okay with that too, because, um, this is a new process for us. We want to learn, we want to improve. Um, but we are, um, trying to provide something useful to other people out there. Yeah, and also uh, I don't I can't remember if we said in the first class first class the first uh, the podcast the first one that we made, uh, but I will uh, just reiterate it just uh, so listeners are aware we do plan on bringing people on the show. Um, so as well, if you know anybody that uh, is uh, accessible and would be able to do something like that, we're also open to that, and we have a few people in mind that we would like to bring on that. Uh, are specifically people who are involved with communication and literacy in certain areas and rhetoric and argumentation, persuasion, so on and so forth. Um, and so definitely feel free to communicate any of that because uh, we we just want to, and I think we said this on the first one too, but I'm going to reiterate it again just because I think it's important. This is a kind of in many ways an exploration project for us you know like we want to a lot of the i think a lot of the reason that we want to do the podcast a little bit off topic but i I just want to say it anyway uh is that uh it puts us in a position where we can learn more about it and so that's what we're hoping we can do with this so it's very much a conversation as opposed to just like two black silhouettes talking on a microphone we we want to know more and that's why that's yeah, why so communication as, is important. As much as we uh, we share things with you, we want you to share things with us. Um, we want to learn from the audience as well. Um, we are not just the teachers. We are the students. And, yeah, thanks for listening to us. This is the Currency of Discourse podcast. Have a good night.